Uh, thanks for joining us for this workshop. Uh, it's graduation day. We're very excited uh, to be graduating. Um, I'm Jackson Renegal, uh, chapter founder of Theta Phi Sigma at CU Boulder. And this is our two time president, uh, Naya O'Reilly. They're here to help me out with this workshop um, on explaining to our friends and family what we've been learning the last few years. And uh, basically, to try to settle all the arguments that we've been having to get on the same page to have these conversations. So yeah, um, seemed like a good day to start. So thank you for coming. Uh, so this is, this is I'm gonna tell you the punchline at the beginning and then we'll like work backwards from there. Uh, so we're all gonna get on board with this. This is the goal. We will explain why that's the goal and you can, yeah, see how you wanna engage with it from there. history, time, and place, and how those all brought us here together today. So um, I just graduated with a BA in Women and Gender Studies, makes me a badass, uh, because um, I thought being trans and growing up Catholic and in the Navy and moving around that my life was all about gender, and then I got here to learn all about gender, and I found out that my life had been way more shaped by being white than any other gender I had occupied throughout my 28 years. So I learned a lot, partly from forming an awesome family with this one, and Channing, and a bunch of other awesome people at Boulder. Um, we all got brought here for a reason, but uh, it's a short sell. We can't afford to stay, and that's all systemic. So I do want to stay, and uh, I'm trying to continue on here, and it's hard, but that's why we need to talk. So we're gonna start with ground rules. Um, we ask, um, and we'll be practicing this as well, sometimes I forget, but yes, uh, ask that you, I ask that you speak with I statements as best you can, listen with an open mind. Uh, yeah, be open to new ideas, understand people come from different experiences, backgrounds, perspectives, so try to first hear what, if there's a disagreement, try to hear out the other person before you try to be heard. Um, just really um, recognize that people have to feel safe and comfortable and supported in order to learn and grow. And so like together as families and communities, we create that space and that opportunity. And uh, we don't want to waste it um, by causing bad feelings. So yeah, is there any other ground rules y'all would like to add before we get started? Just make sure everybody's comfortable. All right, can I get a volunteer to read this quote, please? If you have come here to help me, you are wasting your time. But if you have come because your liberation is bound up with mine, then let us work together. Yes, awesome, thank you. Yeah, um, yeah. Leela Watson is an Aboriginal activist. Um, that's like, this famous quote showed up in our colloquium projects like four times over because that's what we learned. You know, the lesson of solidarity. Uh, it's hard, it's messy, but it's about showing up where, when, and how. Hopefully that one Let's go with how the question Oppression. It's a word that's often used as a blanket term, but there's actually a whole lot more to it. There are four interlocking aspects of oppression, ideological, institutional, interpersonal, and internalized. And it might seem like a small difference, but it's very important to be able to distinguish between each kind because understanding oppression is the first step to fighting it. Let's start with the core at the heart of every form of oppression, ideology. Every system of oppression comes from the idea that one group is somehow better than another. Ideological oppression starts when the dominant group associates positive qualities with itself and negative qualities with the marginalized or othered group. Ideological oppression describes the deeply ingrained social root of inequality. It's the larger overarching idea that leads to the isms. For example, the idea that black people are dangerous is ideological racism. The idea that poor people are lazy is ideological classism. 
Ideological oppression leads to institutional oppression. Institutional oppression is the way that systems and institutions manifest the dominant ideology. Institutions control access, who is able to get to what and how. This includes legal rights, police practice, access to medical care and education, public policy, political power, and media representation. For example, when women make two-thirds of what men make, that's institutional sexism. When a building is constructed without wheelchair ramps, that's institutional ableism. All of this leads to interpersonal oppression. Interpersonal oppression is probably the easiest to recognize because it happens all around us. Interpersonal oppression is the way that people play out discrimination and violence on each other. It can take the form of microaggressions, jokes, stereotypes, and harassment. For example, when a student is bullied for being gay, it's interpersonal homophobia. When a Muslim person is told that they're a terrorist, it's interpersonal Islamophobia. And all those forces, ideological, institutional, and interpersonal, lead to internalized oppression. Internalized oppression is the way that people with marginalized identities internalize narratives of their own inferiority. It's what leads people to feel less than. This is the end goal of oppression. The oppressive party doesn't need to exert force any longer because the marginalized group is enacting oppression on itself to maintain the status quo. It's important to remember that it's never a marginalized person's fault that they feel internalized oppression. It's simply what happens when someone faces negative stereotypes, low expectations, and ongoing discrimination. So, for example, an immigrant feeling embarrassed about having an accent is internalized xenophobia. When a trans woman feels that they can never be a real woman, that's internalized transphobia. So, to review, the four eyes of oppression are ideological, institutional, interpersonal, and internalized. Each of these types are interconnected and completely supported by the others. They can never exist on their own and can even be seen as a cycle. Now that you understand the different kinds of oppression, you're even more equipped to fight it. Don't forget that any effort to dismantle oppression should aim to address it at all four of these levels. Thanks for watching. Tell me 
that something happens to me because of my skin. I can't control it. Genetics are a thing that no one can control. And people shouldn't be able to do that, but it still comes out through our personal talks with each other. And internalized. Internalized oppression means the oppressor doesn't have to exert any more force because we now do it to ourselves and each other. Um, this can be seen with colorism a lot within the POC um, community of us uh, saying like, oh, the lighter you are, the more pretty you are because we hold ourselves to that white standard. And that's super messed up, of course. And we shouldn't be like um, policing ourselves to be like, oh, you aren't like Mexican enough. Oh, you aren't black enough. Oh, you aren't, um, you aren't this because you're this. Like we, it's us policing ourselves to keep us down, to keep us as the oppressed group, even though we don't like to be. You know, uh, oh yeah, so this slide's just bringing it all together, reminding you that they're all connected, they all work together to support each other, one can't exist without uh -huh. the other, that's why the building blocks analogy. Um, but also, uh, what did you say, another skill that helps do that? Something simple, genetics can help it. Yeah, genetics, like. Land. <laughs> Uh, oh, well there's a reason that like the the inn that I want to buy, like that the first people that tried to buy it when it went on the market was a Native American group that wanted to use it as a spiritual lodge and then couldn't get the financing because it's five million dollars. And so I have a vision for a community project as well. Uh, I don't know if I'm right to lead it, but I have a vision and I'm trying to get like all the people I care about invested in it and to agree that it's, see how it, like I want it to be a benefit for everyone. That's what I remembered. Um, that, you know when you see, like as parents, when you see your kids get their hopes up too high and they're like, I can do this and I'm the best soccer player in the world and I'm gonna go to the Olympics. And like eventually, maybe sometimes as a parent, you have to be like, I don't know if that's like really in the cards for you. <laughs> Like, I want you to dream big, but I also want you to know about these realities. And it's like a matter of what realities and structures and barriers do we talk to our kids about and our families, and don't we? And so, like, in thinking about, like, how uh, I was prepared because I was raised female, I was prepared to be, to understand, know about sexism, and that was something I was gonna have to navigate. That was my lot in life. But nobody ever talked to me about what it meant to walk around as a white person, and I've traveled the whole world the more white male I look, the less people that I've loved and have raised me and brought me up feel safe and comfortable around me because they know that if something goes down, cops are gonna take my side. When people come in and say there's a conflict and who reserved this space, I didn't deserve this space. I just look like I belong here. People trust me, they let me do things. That's the whole thing about privilege is the way that we build trust with each other and the tribalism and the allotment of resources. So I told my dad today like, like it's it's about like making you know like honoring your ancestors and the people like showing people that you see where you came from and you understand what the people that helped got you here wanted for you and like knowing that like everybody wants what's best for us that's why they come to our graduations but like sometimes you also have to pause to talk about like other things and let other people determine the priorities Um, so, what is whiteness? Um, it's made up. That's uh, probably one of the most important things I've learned at CU Boulder. Um, so it's really just, um, you know, enough people got together and said, hey, if we say this thing is a thing, then we could be in charge of all the resources and everyone that doesn't qualify, which for a time was Italian, Irish, whatever, um, you know, the newer immigrants are always, you know, demonized ones and then those of us that have been here, we're cool, but like, what about the people that were already here, the native indigenous folks? Oh, you want to see that joke? <laughs> yes, that's fine. Um, so our founding myth of like, oh, Thanksgiving, the pilgrims, we showed up and it was cool and John Smith was like, could y'all please move over? And everyone was like, sure, no problem, nice guns. Like, that's not real. Like, capitalism was built, is designed, it depends on the exploitation of some people and resources. That's why climate change is real and happening. That's why people with money and power don't want you to know that. So, 
I'm definitely gonna hit on that a little bit more um, because I am an environmental studies <laughs> major. Uh, climate change is happening, that is a thing, that is a fact. 97% of scientists believe that climate change is happening. It's not even a belief. We have records showing that CO2 in the atmosphere is definitely rising and this is causing our earth to warm. But there is a thing about environmental justice that comes with environmental studies. For the reason that um, capital, um, capitalist societies or those who are the superpowers in the world, such as the US and China, are disproportionately putting out the CO2. So they are putting out way more, and this is, dis um, this is affecting people in poor countries because they can't help it. They can't like have the resources to like take the CO2, CO2 out of the air. They can't do much to um, protect themselves from this climate change. Like a lot of people depend on the ice staying where it is. A lot of people depend on the um, forests staying and everything being able to be still grown the way that it is in order to feed their families. However, these rich, um, these rich countries, such as the U.S., especially with capitalism, are just continuing to pollute and pollute and pollute, and that's why our um, richest people don't believe in climate change because they know they're the ones who are mainly the factors that are causing this to happen. And of course, this just goes back into privilege and being able to say, "Well, I, it's not a problem to me, so it doesn't affect me." Right, which is where the saying comes from: "Of only white men are allowed to be individuals," um, and in the media. That is often how we get treated, um, but uh, especially, you know, if someone, if there's, there's a shooter, God forbid, something happens, then lone wolf, you know? Uh, but individualism, this culture of like, oh, I'm gonna get mine, and then everything will be okay, like, is exactly how everything's not okay. Because there's not enough for everybody to only think about themselves. Like, the US has the largest carbon footprint of any country in the world like because we just consume 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 because that's all we do because we don't know how to like make our peace with and figure out where we fit in this like like the land theft and the prison labor and how's it working together and like why are we here and like I'm you know I'm queer I'm trying to fix the problem but like like people still don't trust me like you know building trust across privilege like you need to actually really show up like, and that's what I've been learning, still learning, because the people I build relationships with help bring me here. So I wanted to go back to this because I think it's a really awesome graphic that shows you how, like, to just say, oh, slavery's in the past and blah, 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 like, that's done with, okay, maybe there's not, maybe, arguable, maybe there's not active genocide going on right now. Um, some people have called, like, the rampant, like, murders of, like, black, especially black women of color, trans women of color, um, being the most prevalent, we can see how these systems do still build up and allow and perpetuate all these other incidents that we want to say are isolated, but systems do what they're designed to do. I joined the Navy, I hated learning the mission statement because it didn't fit with me, I was like, war, dominance, projecting that worldwide, is that really how we should use so much of our research resources as a country? But like enough people agreed after 9-11 that that's what needed to happen. And so I'm now very well taken care of. I can survive in a system. It wasn't designed for me, but I learned how to navigate it, largely through the help of personal relationships with people who taught me. And now, <laughs> I have to look back and look back at how I got to where I'm at. Be honest about all of that, you know, like pull back the curtain. I didn't write my speech ahead of time, you know, I just I just said what I feel and this is the stuff that I think about and talk about all the time anyways. And really school, hey Gwen, has just given me the resources to do that better. Um, it's not the turnout that I thought it was going to be, but That's we're recording fine. it, so... Knowledge is knowledge. Welcome. Thank you for coming. Yes. Um, and if at any point you want to just, like, do rad poetry, you can, but I know you just got off work, so no pressure. I'm not going to put you on the spot like I did at the open mic. Um, <laughs> what is happening? You just make yourself at home. Yeah. Okay, so you did this, and you can... Cultural appropriation! Fucking stop! Um, <laughs> So, um, no, it's not lifting up or giving any power to um, the people who are marginalized. No, it's you taking my culture and wearing it like it's a costume because you think that it's your social justice, but it's not. Um, seriously, like, 
Cultural appropriation is the act of adopting elements of an outside from often a culture of people of color and including knowledge, practices, and symbols without understanding or respecting the original context um, and culture of this. We see this a lot during Halloween, but I'm going to hit on Cinco de Mayo, which just <laughs> happened. Um, so, for those who not, don't know, Cinco de Mayo is not Mexico's Independence Day. Mexico's Independence Day is considered September 16th, 1810, yada yada, back in the day. Um, but, Cinco de Mayo was literally about one battle that was won against the French a long time ago that gave Mexico its rallying cry that we can come together and defeat a force. However, the way it's celebrated, especially here in the US, it's not like, oh yes, this is giving power to all of the Mexican people. No, it's an excuse to eat tacos and drink tequila for a lot of white people. Like, you can't wear our sombreros and put on a poncho and say like, oh well, I'm so woke because I like know that this was happening and that peop these people are depressed, or er, depressed, ooh, oppressed. <laughs> um, and what that me, do <laughs> me doing this like makes it better because it shows that me having like an allyship with them. No, it's not. It's you making fun of my culture even more. Like, you're not helping me by doing this. You're not saying, you're like, you're putting something on for a night that you're going to black out and that's going to be the end of it. Instead, I want people to take action and speak. Recently, I got quoted by CPR saying how I'm tired of people in power saying that they're going to help me and refuse to do so. Um, this is not what I want. This is not how you go about this. I want to see action. I want to see you at our rallies. I don't want you to be putting my culture on your body just so it makes you look because the key word in appropriation is property. So capitalism, once land becomes property, then it's about who owns it and who has the right to profit off of it. Um, whereas their stolen lands, which, you know, after that battle that was won with the independence, then the US was like, never mind, sign this treaty, sign here, we're just gonna move the state line, country line down a few states. Participation. Please. <laughs> it's also, like, again, with property, the property and owning of bodies. Yeah. And so, again, why are we entitled to certain people, not only lands, but their own bodies? And so looking at these examples as well, I like the popular one with mats. When people call their um, dreads mats and they're white people, they're like, oh, well, it's mine. It's like, no, you believe you own this because we've owned black and brown bodies for a really long time. We own this idea of, like, what you get to be. And so that's why they think it's permissible. It's because they tie it to their own ideas of, like, self or whatever. Yeah. It's also like who's also punished for this. So a bigger thing with cultural appropriation and ownership is like who's punished for being themselves, owning themselves, largely people of color, because it is an F you to the colonizer or was for a really long time. People wearing the shikis, wearing saris, wearing bindis, these were things that people were made fun of for constantly. And then now because it's fashionable and because it's profitable, do you see like a lot of white people stepping in and like, oh yeah, this is hip, I'm with it. Whereas people of color are still punished actively for having things, having like all these things. Yeah, thank you very much for coming. I appreciate you. <laughs> a plus for me. Uh, yes, definitely. <laughs> oh yeah, and like just a quick example of something I've seen looking at um, places to live or buy or whatever in Boulder, these prayer flags. I didn't know until doing this presentation in March with Bree that you're not supposed to have them inside. But I do at least know that part of being a good person is not to take something that clearly has ritual resemblance to some culture I'm not familiar with and just use it as decoration. So. Um, if you're wondering, like, oh no, have I done this? Have I been part of it? Like, maybe you have. I probably could think of an example of times that I've done these things. We're not here to say that that makes you a bad person. We're here to provide the knowledge so that you can decide for yourself, am I honoring the culture this came from? Am I thinking about and paying attention to the meaning and history behind it? Um, yeah, so those are, those are some really important questions to ask yourself to help determine if you're like if what you're doing is okay or not so yeah recognize the the, mm -hmm. the meaning that the makers the meaning and the value that the makers um assign to it because it's it's workers that create all the value and change the lives hey yo hey. sweet let's talk about slaves and nation because <laughs> you know that's awesome um no no i think you must have already done um <laughs> so fetishization is essentialized in so many parts 
of our cultural narrative, especially when it comes to dating. Everything from dating shows of shows and dating apps that I can't read without glasses. Uh, um, okay. <laughs> it's okay. Okay, sweet. Everything from dating shows and dating apps that invest their interactions on a white supremacist, misogynistic point of view, of course. Fetishizing people of color furthers the othering of their bodies, which are deemed desirable because they are seen as exotic and a part of the social norm. And it's just a preference phrase in relation to dating slash hooking off, <laughs> hooking up. Um, this isn't okay at all. Um, it is bringing back to the whole thing of like, whose bodies do we have control over? And like, who gets to say they have control over those bodies? Uh, small personal story, I used to go to um, frat parties a lot um, in my freshman year, and of course, a big thing was a lot of those guys coming up to me and being like, oh wow, you look exotic, what country are you from? And assuming that I wasn't from the US, and um, saying like, oh, you probably know how to dance like a Mexican, or like, oh, you probably know how to do cough cough a lot like a different race, right? Um, and it's horrible. It's a horrible thing to say. Like, we don't know if this, uh, this attraction is authentic or a fetish, but we need to be able to have this conversation in order to undo all of this um, idea that these bodies are considered desirable just because they're different. Like, in um, society, white bodies are often like the standard. That's what we see in our like Instagram feeds or on our Facebook or in magazines. But at the same time, when we see like a person of color being on there, it's like, oh damn, she be thick. Like, it's not valuing the person that it is, it's just looking at that body and being like, that's a body that I can do whatever I want with. It's a lot more of that, that person is my property and because of that I can hold them to a different standard and make them like my fantasy. Yeah. But again, when we're talking about recruit and missing indigenous women, it stems to this. Yeah. Why is it that indigenous women are more likely than any other group to be raped in their lifetime by people outside of their communities? That's ludicrous. Usually it is within communities that like this sort of thing happens. But it stems to the idea that, again, they're property. There are people who are somehow like deserving like this colonial gaze, which means that they're afforded none of the protections that we are. And then even shifting that into child trafficking, where it is a lot of native and indigenous women, it's also a lot of black so it's not that like fetishization is like harmless, blah blah blah. It's just like gross dudes. It's all of us because we're complicit when we don't call people out who are actively saying, "Oh yeah, she be thick" or things like that, because we're not calling people out and we think it's just like, "Oh, like I'll fight like Pocahontas, whatever," and not like calling out our parents, calling out our friends. Then we are absolutely complicit in how all of these women, and now increasingly Muslim women as well, are being subjected to like the Western flair and Western violence. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, I took, I took classes in um, Denmark last summer on prostitution and human trafficking. We learned how um, all, like the most victims of all genders come from the poorest countries because it's capitalism that drives migration and that's like what's forcing like environmental migrants, like you said, people escaping, like yeah, sinking conditions. I was talking to somebody earlier that they said something about Rome not being here forever and I was like, well, that would get people to care. Then they would listen to the environment like, if that's gonna be underwater, now we gotta take action. And that's a shitty realization, but. I mean, the slave trade is back in Libya. And it's not just Libya. Like, we actively have investigations here about child marriage and about communities that are like disproportionately subjected to it. Yeah. And so even one of the most famous court cases, I feel like people have been looking at this now, the Bobbitt case, like the woman who cut off her husband's penis, people don't realize that she was a South American Exactly, yeah, because just because you're here doesn't mean you're free or safe if the law enforcement mechanisms don't have your back. So, yeah. Uh. Shout out to 90 Day Fiance by TLC for what? letting this be a show that that's all about. Oh, that's cool. Um, <laughs> okay, so. 
So I made this slide because um, growing up, I somewhere got the idea that it was just rude to talk about race. Like, we all kind of understood within our families that like, not everyone had it as good as us, but like, that's, you know, we're some good people and like, we don't know why that is and we don't have to talk about that because that's uncomfortable. Let's just keep moving and everything will be okay because we mean well. Well, on the opposite side of that, um, my parents had to give me the talk when I was the talk, and that's like um, in my other presentation we like said how like a bunch of people when they hear the talks they think of the birds and bees and that awkward stuff your parents have to talk to you about. However, this talk is very very different. This was my mother sitting me down when I turned 16 and being like, I want to drive, I want to learn how to drive, and my mother being like, the world is a horrible place out there. Like, do you realize if you start driving that you're going to be pulled over for no reason and you're going to be scared that you're going to lose your life and end up as that next brown kid on TV who accidentally moved a little too fast and has two shots already in them? Like, my parents had to make me aware that this was happening. I mean, I come from a wonderful melting pot that is San Diego where there's diversity because we have so many military bases. So people from literally all around the world are there. And we all were somewhat aware that things were going on, that we weren't necessarily all equal in the eyes of the government or anyone else. But at the same time, having your parent sit you down and say, people are going to hate you just because of the color of your skin and will actively work so hard against you just so you don't get what you want because they think you're less than. Even though I'm exactly the same as everyone else. <laughs> Trying twice as hard, doing triple the work to prove that you're at least as much. Exactly. Even in my like academic career right now, I'm like going to graduate in three years. I put on an honors or an honors thesis on my whole degree. I have a minor in atmospheric and oceanic sciences because I need to prove myself that I am more in order to be considered anything. Yeah, my dad commented, "Wow, there's a lot of gender studies majors that double major. That's impressive." I said, "Well, yeah, we kind of understand how the game works. So, uh, yeah, we can." get all the, you know, accolations and cords, stoles, whatever I was handed to dress myself for celebrating these accomplishments, but, uh, but really it's about the people that helped us get here and recognizing, honoring that, like, the intentions are good and, uh, as long as that's the case, that's still not enough, but my, uh, it's an amazing start and that's why it's something we can start here in Boulder is because there is enough, like there are enough resources, we have them. We, in every layer of that sense, like have what we need here. We just need to be better about taking care of each other, listening to each other, taking care of ourselves, and recognizing what we do that may or may not affect, or that may affect somebody else's idea of what is possible, and that's a hell of a responsibility. So if you, you know, find yourself or are afraid of being part of the problem, um, just don't freak out. Just think about how you can be part of the solution instead and just start every day with a little step. Um, and uh, yeah, get, get your people is <laughs> my favorite uh, thing that a lot of my um, black queer friends post a lot. Uh, they're just like, oh, this crazy white person did this, and it was, you know, of course, like, ignorant and sensitive, and like, I don't understand culture, that's not a thing that I have, like, because everything is just made to make me feel comfortable. <laughs> so, uh, <clears throat> yeah, it's about recognizing, like, how within, within our families and conversations, we might be, like, replicating these systems, because, like I said, systems do what they're designed to do, they reinvent themselves, they stay true to the mission, the people in it, it doesn't matter what your intentions are. If you're not paying attention to the mission, like, you are going towards it, whether you're paying attention or not. That carrier I was on for eight months, like, I was not driving the ship, but I was there and I made a difference and I got a name for myself because I was the only trans person and people wanted to hear me talk about that. But what about race? I could say so much more about race that people haven't said before because I've had my ear to struggle for 28 years. So it's not my struggle anymore, but I'm not gonna listen to my parents and just find my way out of it because I can, because veterans get taken care of, because 
you know, I can be successful if I want to, and I just need to do the right things, and blah, blah, blah. Well, so does everybody. <laughs> and there are people that want to help me, and that's awesome, and I appreciate it, and together we're making more. <laughs> but first, we gotta pay attention to the injuries, the wrongs, the wrongs in the past, the systems that keep on replicating themselves and injuring the people that we care about, and sometimes each other. Um, I explained to my dad this morning the connections between um, heteropatriarchy, uh, so like homophobia, sexual violence, white supremacy, and how like they're all connected and it's all one conversation that we keep having. <laughs> and like once we finally have the conversation, maybe we won't have to keep having the same one. Here's my hope. <laughs> <laughs> Sweet. So in order to address the solutions to what is going on, we have to talk about microaggressions. So microaggressions, um, can reinforce all the other isms through like small minor comments and actions and things like that. And it's important to understand that we need to have a constant awareness of what our comments are and what impact those comments have toward other people. And sometimes it is not the easiest to notice, especially if that comment isn't toward you. Um, but we all need to be like hyper aware that this is happening and be able to step in and be like, hey, what you said isn't necessarily the best thing. Uh, more than a personal story. Um, <laughs> uh, recently, I had a academic debate in my economics class uh, surrounding globalization. So that is already a very heated topic. Um, and the person that I was debating against was a white female. Um, and at one point, she said the blacks don't deserve environmental justice. In, so, <laughs> in 2019, this happened this year. <laughs> this happened maybe a month ago, um, right? And I simply was like, "Hey, can you not call me the black and please address me as a person and as a people?" And um, she decided to hit back with the, "Oh, well, people call me white and not Anglo-Saxon," um, and like that to a bunch of people in that class, because I am one of the three POCs in that class, didn't take it as like she said anything wrong. She just debated the wrong point. Um, well, to me, I was like, no, she dehumanized me within a second. And like, to everyone else, this looked like a microaggression. This is a microaggression. But to me, it was a blatant attack on who I am. There's that, um, famous saying, it's like, microaggressions are, is death by a thousand cuts. Um, it adds up. Things like this aren't something that happens once every blue moon. No, this can happen every single day, and it's just more weight on a POC's body to keep going. Like, it's hard to want to keep going if people are constantly bringing you down and want to push you down. And they do this by, like, saying these backward comments. And if other people can have that like responsibility of pointing out when stuff like this happens, it lessens the weight on my back to have to continuously be like, don't say that about me. That's not true. Like, stop, that's ignorant. I shouldn't have to say that. Yeah, because there's so much happening on ideological and institutional interpersonal. So that by kind of by time it manifests itself in the interpersonal like just a conversation, just a microaggression, just a just just stuff happens with an accident. I mean, well, it's a long day. I'm sorry. I guess your gender wrong. Oops. Like, move past the discomfort. Like, like embrace being uncomfortable as an opportunity to learn. Appreciate the people that call you out because they are trying to teach you something. And it is because we care. Because we wouldn't sit down and talk to you if we didn't. So. Microaggressions are called that because they happen on the micro level, like one person or one person is enough for a microaggression, not because it's minimally significant. Because to me, I might be like, oh, microaggression, oops, hit one of those on the chart. But to deny it, I might be like, fuck you, dude. Like, it's been all day, all this shit, my entire life. It's always fuck you. I don't care about you having a tough day. I've had every life, every day has been, yeah. My hardest, most memorable day on the ship is a lot of them. All of them that I thought, I stood on the edge of the pier and I thought about how I could jump over without getting in trouble. And 
without feeling guilty and without worrying about the people I've left behind. And now I know that um, I came out, I survived that because um, the people that helped me through the day to day, they might not have understood. Um, and it's not the same to be, to be black and Latina as it is to be a white transgender person. Um, but we all had our own struggles on the ship and we were there for each other when it mattered. We talked about these bigger things could and tried to sort through like our different understandings and backgrounds and perspectives. And we did that over lunch, over dinner, every meal, with humor. Um, I learned about so, so much about yeah where they came from and then yeah it's my turn to sometimes listen. Participation. So again, kind of going off of what Jackson was bringing up with the myth of meritocracy as I read this chart. But <laughs> again, it is this idea that it's totally acceptable for us to say, well, oh, I'm queer, I'm exempt of being racist, I'm exempt of being misogynistic, I'm exempt of being xenophobic, because a lot of the times in queer community, I'm just reading the room, I'm like, I'm pretty sure I'm queer, but like, <laughs> but it really becomes this idea of like, oh, well, tit for tat, I can pick my battles, I can pick when I'm racist, when I'm sexist, when I'm really anti-black, misogynoir, and it's this, it's because we've, again, been like conditioned that activist work is comfortable work. And again, as Jackson touched on, you're not really doing the work well, and I think that's fair to say you're not doing it well, if you're at all comfortable. It should make you uncomfortable because you're unlearning your conditioning. And so whenever you're unlearning, hey, what my mom and dad said was really racist, and I never said anything, and now like after 25 years I have to say something, that's uncomfortable. And so when we are confronting how we've been conditioned, and then confronting the ways in which we're really oppressive towards other people, and then even ourselves sometimes, like when we police like queerness based on, you know, again, white, heteronormative thing. Because I mean, there's a lot of queer people who still kind of live in a binary. And that Western binary doesn't translate to black and brown bodies or experiences. And so it is like tit for tat, it just doesn't work that way. There is a hierarchy to this. There is a hierarchy in race. There's a hierarchy in phenotype. There's a hierarchy in gender expression. And so just coming to terms with, hey, I am oppressive. And in some ways, all of us will be oppressive no matter what we do by nature of like being from America, being lighter skinned people, that's fine. But if you get into your little shame bubble and then the like, well, I'm oppressed too, like shut up, like you can't tell me anything, then ultimately we're just going to be on the sides of the oppressors because unification via silence or via just boxing people in to where they're comfortable and neat for you isn't unification, isn't a movement. What it is is just making sure that we're divided against one another, that we don't have a solid, solid ground and that we're tolerant and tolerance is what breeds destruction. And so I think that was just what I was going to say. Don't mm -hmm. snap with my hands are sweaty. I was like, I love what you say. Thank you. <laughs> like, it doesn't work if I get nervous. All right. So, uh, all right. So the difference. Allies, you might probably hear a lot of talk about, like, I need you to be an ally. I want you to be an ally. Like, be there for me. Like, well, um, again, allies, generally, great intentions, not necessarily the same willingness to grapple with these larger systems and our roles in them as much as is needed to make actual change. So being an accomplice is different because, well, what does accomplice make y'all think of? Committing crimes together. Right? <laughs> and generally, we're like, wait, we shouldn't commit crimes, right? But what if the system is unfair? What if it's wrong? What if it's hurting people? What if people are locked up, black and brown and trans and queer and disabled and mentally ill people are locked up in prisons because a bunch of white people figured out how to profit off of that. And that is a direct outcropping of the system of slavery that so many white people want to say is in the past and people should get over racism, but it all goes together and we need to get on the same page or we'll keep having these conversations. So all activism is about showing up where, when, and how, because that's all you can control. And not just saying that you have the best of intentions, but listening enough to see, am I conveying that? Do people feel safe around me? Like, do people feel uncomfortable? Do you trust me? Like, <laughs> like the things that people navigate, like smokers, queers going to like trying to find our bars and our places 
um, I like I don't even know. I'm sure like yeah, I don't even know the depths of people of color doing this same thing. But the idea of building a community somewhere you've never been and finding a home, like people have a lot of experience. With it. I know, I'm just like that, but um, <laughs> but it's also this idea that I've noticed that's really popular is that a lot of people think that they're outside of the problem looking in and not that they're part of it and that you do dismantle it from within. So like we've touched, like they've touched on it, they do several times in the presentation, but it really is switching mentality. I think the most frustrating thing ever about a lot of allies, I know a lot of like cis pet dude allies <laughs> who are white, is that this, this, this idea is like, no, I support you. Like, oh my gosh, like I'm so here for you. Someone said something terrible and I was like, wow, that's terrible. It's like, and then, like five minutes after they say, well, you know, like, just be glad that I'm like here for this. Or like, I'm here for this. Or like, I don't have to be, but I am. And so ever if that switches your mind, like, oh, I don't have to be here for this, then you're not an accomplice. And you're not here for anything really, because it's the idea that, oh, I'm separate from this. When we're all in the same boat and it's sinking fast. Like this could easily be like the climate change talk. Yeah, we're not gonna all, do that right now. Part of it. Capitalism <laughs> is all part it's, of it. <laughs> it's holistic. And it's, so it's a holistic oppression of all peoples. And so even though like there are people who are like on the top, like this shit's going down with you too. I mean, I guess you're going to Mars, question Mars, Elon yeah. Musk bullshit. <laughs> like that's a cool thing people think they're gonna do. But when push comes to shove, it's this idea of like, you are not outside of the system. I don't care if you like go in the woods and you live your like independent, like that's not how this shit works. And so you're going down with us. And so if you really do sincerely want to be a part of a better world, then you have to say, okay, shit, it's not like me a white person or me like a cis person like coming in and being like, wow, this is terrible. Let me do something because it's so bad for y'all. It's like, nah, it's bad for you too. Yeah. If you want this world to be habitable for anyone else. Yeah, that shortage of water, like we cannot just have water only go to the richest people and then because only the richest people are going to be able to escape to space and then if we colonize that and just take all the resources then we're going to end up in the same problem at graduations having the same conversations about yes jen <laughs> oh it just kind of reminded me of the quote at the beginning like mm -hmm. um the ship is going down with all of us yeah, yeah. But yeah, so it's like, I don't know how to drive a ship. I've been on one, but I don't, and no one's taught me, does anybody know how to drive a ship? Like you helped us hook up this AV stuff. I was like, it'll work out. We're gonna have everything we need there. And like Brandon stepped in and helped run it because I didn't know how to do it. And, but we did have everything we need. It got here in time. Because everybody helped out where they could and they saw like, oh, I can make a sign. I can do this. I can share that. I can print this. Like everybody helped make this happen. So like, it's okay that this is, like the Channing's family is the people that are here and not all, like I invited the whole graduation but I also said because I know how hard it is to pull on those personal relationships to have these uncomfortable conversations my own father had to catch a plane a plane but he will be watching this recording so thank you very much yeah and as an environmentalist I'm gonna hit back on that the, I, the current IC, IPCC report says that we have 12 years of good conditions before catastrophic change ha changes happen. And a lot of people will think that, of course, this is going to hit the poor countries first. However, with the US, California, everything on the coast, Louisiana, we're all going down under the water. <coughs> and like a bunch of our profitable industries are in those places. Like, we can't just ignore that this is happening. Like, nature doesn't care who the hell you are. It doesn't, it will take you out. Will a bear care if you're white or black? No, you're, it's a bear, you're in its face. It's going to get you if you make it upset. Like, nature doesn't care. But the cool thing is that we can all work together to make it better for all of us. Like, marginalized voices are so important and bring not only diversity, but new solutions to different problems. And if we don't have those voices, how are we going to solve those problems? Thus, it is a white and POC, um, problem like we need to solve this together it can't just be me and it can't just be you it has to be all of us because we all are affected exactly yeah so yeah i have taken all my notes my whole life of how to get a seat at the table and how to i mean i still have to learn how to do golf apparently to be like a successful white man someone told me that once i don't know i haven't learned it yet i don't have time but um the point is uh when 
whenever you are invited to a table, if your friend is not welcome, you need to talk about that when you come to the table. Uh, if there's enough and uh, the person serving says there's not enough, like me last time I'm bringing someone to dinner and my mom being like, oh my gosh, what? Look, what? There's eight people who live in this house. What's one more mouth to feed, right? Like it's about who we take care of in our tribe, who we see as worthy of protection, of help. There's all kinds of information that we process to make these decisions. It takes continual reflection and you can skip whenever. These are ways that you can help. Clearly there's, like, not everyone can help in the best way at a time. We know that these situations are hard. And we know that speaking up isn't even hard because sometimes that does put a target on your back. Um, however, like, as there are varying degrees of what you can do in a situation, there's varying degrees of, like, it's okay. Like, we don't expect you to, like, come out of this talk and just be at a protest the next day being, like, I'm fighting for all human rights, things like that. No, it's, it's going to be some change, and it's a lot of self-reflectance of thinking, like, how am I a part of the problem, and how can I not be a part of the problem? And being an actor, an ally, or an accomplice, like, you can do your part in any of these ways. Of course, I would prefer if you do some of these more than others, um, but it's still helpful. It's still helping us, and that's not all that we need, but it sure as hell makes it a little bit easier for us. Yeah, my, my uncle was like a 30 year SEAL in the Navy and he was, we were talking about this stuff over dinner and family dinner someday, we're both stationed in Virginia, let's chat. Uh, and he said something, something, I support the Black Lives Matter thing, blah, 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 but like, it's not like they want me to show up there at their rallies. And I was like, well, actually, the power of you showing up with all the authority and respect that you have in the communities and networks you come from would have so much weight if you just showed up. So it's realizing it's not on, it's not on, it's not the responsibility of, and it's also not necessarily possible for people to end their own oppression. Generally, you need a little help. It's hard to be, have people hear you out when you're personally affected by the systems that are bringing you down every day and then people are like what why does it matter are you sure like are you allowed to, what are you doing here i'm like i'm just trying to sleep i work here i'm trying to pee i don't need all these questions I'm trying to do my job got too many people to take care of don't stop me just to explain the lies that you were made to believe <laughs> and uh yeah let's just move on from there um so yeah it's uh it's a process it's a learning process reflection recapping we talked about that. We talked about being called out as a gift. Um, calling in, so the idea of calling in versus calling out. Does anybody, has anybody, is anyone familiar with these? Uh, yeah. You don't have to do the work if you don't want to, uh -huh. but you can. I mean, I think that, I think it's also navigating when, because I think some people now try to completely switch it to like, you only call in, you never call out. And it's more complex than that though. Yeah. So calling out again is just like, you see someone like, we're gonna dox you, like you're gone, out, you're canceled, also part of cancel culture. It's this idea of like, we saw you, you did something wrong, we're going to also shame you, is also what happens in all of our culture. And then you're like jettisoned from the community. Whereas calling in, calling in is like, hey, like we don't want to be rid of you. Like you're still a very valuable person to be in our space. So we're going to like call you in, like tell you you said something weird, and then hold this dialogue with you. And I think though, there's a bit of differences. Like if you're a Nazi, I'm gonna call you out. Like and. <laughs> I think it's also navigating that. Again, I try to reference Boulder because Boulder's like a little special weird place where it's like never call someone out and also like it's a safe space. Again, if you're doing this work, I think there very rarely are safe spaces or brave spaces because whenever you challenge power structure, you're making someone feel inherently unsafe. And so it's navigating like, is this person a staunch fascist who thinks I shouldn't like literally exist? Or is this person like someone who you know and care about and love and they said something weird? And so when you are calling someone in, it's like, okay, like we want you in this community. We want you in this space. And we all don't know everything. I don't know everything. No one is the authority on everything. And so it's also coming to terms with that. Because we're never right or wrong, unless you're a fascist and a racist. Then you're wrong. <laughs> but, like, but we're never absolutely right or absolutely wrong. And so it really is like, when time do you, like, when do you bring the hammer? And when do you bring like a thumbtack to stick into the wall? 
Like, are you gonna like have to nail this into someone, like smash them up or call them out? Or are you just gonna be like, let me just put this notice that that was whack, and we can have a real conversation later? I'm still a proponent of co-op culture, but <laughs> yeah, no, you're right. When there's an active harm happening, that is what needs to happen. I got caught up in the white boulder liberalism of like, I'm doing my best, and I mean well, and we're just we're creating this safe space together because we all wanted to be happy, and then people got hurt. Mostly people I care a lot about because some people in the community didn't want to acknowledge the structures that we're all navigating. It's just harder for some of us than others. And some people have a stake in denying structures like white supremacy and capitalism and how they affect us. Um, but I learned the hard way, hard by letting people I care about get hurt because I didn't know how powerful it could have been for me to interrupt and stop that like racist interaction from happening while it was happening. If I had realized my place and my opportunity and also coming in terms of what people expected from me based on I had started the group and then I didn't step up. And so I was like, it's a safe place and then it wasn't. And that's why education is so fucking important. And so yeah, I've been just trying to recap everything I've learned lately. So <laughs> this <tech talk. laughs> I also would like to give Jackson credit as, as soon as that did happen, Jackson had to think about it for himself and decided to teach our whole org like about unlearning whiteness. Like parts of this um, presentation stemmed from that horrible interaction that happened. Like emergency it did <laughs> emergent it was an emergency workshop we had to attend. Um, the action shouldn't have happened. The, um, the way we had to learn shouldn't have been the way we had to learn, but we did, and we're opening up this dialogue to everyone else because we know how important it is to see someone that you love get totally torn down by someone else to the point of them shaking and crying in front of the whole org while screaming at them. <laughs> but it's, this is important. This is why we need to talk about it. This is why we gotta do these things in order for people like me to be safe and be able to navigate the world in the best way possible, even if the cards I've been given weren't the best. Yeah, and that's only because of the systems, not because there's anything wrong. <laughs> that's true, yeah. With how you show up. Um, yeah. Uh, be mindful of give and take, yeah. Just pay attention to reciprocity in your relationships. Do I only show up to be like, well, I'm here for the easy stuff, like here's a rally, or like doing that when it matters and when you can, and also doing everything else that you can when you can. Be gentle on yourself, it's a process, but do what you can when you can, and that's what matters. And so we have this list of resources. It's a growing list. This uh, QR code, if you take a picture, it goes to Google Drive called Unlearning Whiteness, and uh, I started, it has a bunch of resources and also links to a much larger resource library um, that I got through activism that I don't even know anymore, but there's a chain that gives credit where credit is due to the makers. And yeah, it's just like sharing that information, uh, yeah, to start these conversations locally and in our families and yeah, scale up from there. Because people listen when they're drawn in by personal relationships and when they trust you, they feel safe and they believe you that it's worth their time and that that's why they're in this space and that it matters. And at a prison, trying to stop uh, CU prison labor, uh, <clears throat> that's a bad system. I'm trying to stop, get them to buy all their furniture that's made in, by prisoners. Uh, Cause yeah, that's no good. So we had a meeting, I told Gwen that I came here because it's a great place to be trans and they were like, is it? And I said, oh, <laughs> well, right. That's why we're here. Cause it's only that way for binary white trans folks, for now. But having these conversations is one step, one piece of the puzzle to making it better for everyone. Everyone can have a seat at the table and should. Yes. So also with like reading and viewing, I think it's also more important to dissect what you're currently viewing and reading and recognizing not only like who's at the table, because I've always kind of hated that too. I'm like, I don't want to eat at a table that you've carved up my ancestors on. Like, I don't need that. And so it's like sometimes completely dismantling what you're like, what you're eating and what you're reading. 
And so it's like, well, there's like a lot of really great like queer shows out there, quote, quote. And you would watch them and you're like, wow, this is kind of trash because literally no one in this is a person of color. Or all the people of color need to be saved from something. Or all the femme characters are like, like performing a femininity that's just inaccessible to people. And so I think in viewing, it's not just going out of your way to view things that are like, like approved, like stamped, like Bechel, like Bechel test, like passed or whatever. But it's like, okay, what am I currently watching and how is it really failing the people who I claim to want to support? And sometimes it's like watching it and being like, okay, I can't watch this anymore because I can't unsee what I've unlearned or like I can't see it in the same light. And it's also like going out of your way and then saying, okay, but why is this show failing? And how can like I, as cause some of us are creators, I think most people are creators to be honest, but how can I create something that fills that void? And so it's not just like poems, but, like, mm -hmm. but it's like paper and academic works and applying for more Euro grants too. So I would even ask like recommended reading and viewing is that we also, like we're on this campus, there's money out there. And so for undergraduate research opportunities, there's the chance for us to come together and get funding for research and for thought that we know needs to be funded. Hey, same Z's, I'm hey, a being funded for being a rock star yeah. in the sciences. That's no, I'm getting matters. funded for, for um, I'm getting funded for, so like, it's also like in a lot of our fields because they're traditionally very stagnant, very like academic, white, Western. So I'm in philosophy half the time. And so I'm taking like Nietzsche's will to power and I'm reinterpreting and I'm asking what is power, what is strength? And then I'm going to Colombia and I'm asking like black and brown people, what is power, what is strength? And coming back and asking, juxtapositioning that with this, what is power, what is strength? So it is reinvigorating our fields and of themselves because even women in gender studies has a lot of like really weird tendencies up to like of erasure. And so it's like, okay, this is the established base. How do I fuck this up, get paid for it and contribute to a body of work that has yet to be I'm excited for you getting paid to research. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> I hear that's the dream. I'm not really a lifelong academic. <laughs> it is the dream, and I love it. <laughs> Good. Good. Taking classism and throwing it at rich people in LA it is my sense. dream. Because the best research is going to come from the people that are interested. So, oh yeah, the speech, the pitch that I made for gender studies was like looking at your the intersections of your like path privilege, perspective, and passion to see where you can have the most power to affect change. Uh, so I probably say that during the speech, but yeah, that was that was how they gave me the mic, was I said that's what I was gonna say, but <laughs> I just worried about framing it instead. So thank you for coming. <laughs> and I hope you guys realize how significant it is that you showed up here, because um, this really started something huge, so thank you. Or the continuation, I should say, because I've learned from centuries of black and indigenous feminist scholars who have been saying the same things for a very long time. <laughs> so, much appreciation for everyone contributing and being part of this. Thank you very much. Buying it, and that's why I had to talk to my dad about it because we're trying to buy our way. You got one? Trying to buy our way out of capitalism. You know about it. You've heard. Okay, cool. Um, so, like, I don't need his money because he's my dad. I, but because he's my dad, he should provide the resources that he can to contribute. And if he wants to support me in some other way, then that's fine. But, like, this has to happen because. That's true. It's a dream for Boulder, you know? Like, the people that live here want to make it better for everybody that wants to live here and enjoy the mountains and stuff, so, yeah. Okay, I didn't realize you were still recording, but thanks. <laughs>